Um, I'm Miriam Lawrence. I'm the interim director of the Institute for Retired Professionals. The IRP sponsors these Fridays at One events, and this is the first Friday one, Fridays at One of the fall semester. So welcome. Um, Ken Whitty, who is the uh, chair of the Fridays at One committee, will introduce our speaker. But I just wanted to make sure that IRP members know that immediately following this session, we will have a meet and greet for new members of the IRP. So new members, you should have gotten a badge, a name tag. Did you all get your name tag? Yep. OK, very good. And we'll have a little collation afterwards. Everybody's invited for refreshments afterwards. And the IRP meet and greet will take place then, too. Um, also new members of the IRP, if you have not yet selected the photograph that you would like in the IRP directory, please see Peter Houts. Peter is right there. He has all of your pictures, and you can make your selection. OK, so let me introduce Ken Whitty, the IRP member who is the chair of the Fridays at One programs. Ken? Thank you, Miriam. Um, for everyone here who are not members of the IRP, just want to give you a little sense of who we are. Right? Um, you know, the, it's the, we are the Institute for Retired Professionals, started 54 years ago. And it, we are a pioneering lifelong learning group and functions as a peer-to-peer -peer, um, institution. That means the students teach each other. And we have some 35 seminars um, every semester. And they're taught by the students to each other. Um, and um, if anyone here is interested who's not a member of the IRP, there's going to be an information session on September 20, Monday, September 26th at 2 o'clock. And if you're interested, email us at irp at newschool.edu or call 212-229-5682 or speak to any one of us afterwards, OK? So today, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. She's Laura Brown, an associate professor at the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University. She's the author of Jockeying for the American Presidency, The Political Opportunism of Aspirants. It's a study of presidential candidates from the 1790s to 2008. And she's currently working on a book comparing what's happening today in the US to what took place during the Gilded Age of the late 19th century. She's here today uh, to put this year's extraordinary election in historical perspective <laughs> and explain how we got the two candidates we have today. <laughs> Lara. Let me just say thank you for having me here. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, as somebody who did teach undergraduate students and now I teach graduate students, my favorite group of people is actually to talk to people like you, retired professionals, because guess what? You remember history. <laughs> you don't just have a vague notion that it existed at some point. Um, so, I mean, it is really extraordinary from a perspective standpoint, and I'll just share this with you. Our current students have no memory of the 2000 election and the electoral sort of contest that happened with Florida and you know hanging Chad and all of the other uh, machinations that occurred after that election. So, you know, it is it is quite a challenge to try to describe to them that in some ways this election is extraordinary, in other ways it's actually not. And what I'm going to try to do today um, is essentially give you a sense of both the work that I've done um, in terms of my own research, my own investigations. Um, I love history. I mean, I just fundamentally love it. And as a political scientist, in some ways, I'm not really supposed to love it. I'm supposed to love models and patterns and empirical um, sort of statistical uh, similarities. But I will tell you that history involves people and I think politics fundamentally involves people too. 
And so one of my, my sort of long-standing frustrations with my own field of political science is that it tends to leave out people, sort of like the economists in their models leave out people. This is why I would argue that many economists aren't very good at predicting what's going to happen in the market. I would also argue it's part of why political science is sometimes struggling and straining to understand how people engage with each other. Um, political science in its oldest form really began with the notion that its focus was to understand human nature and how we create a society to best fit that nature. So this is why I believe we can't ever leave people out of it. And one of the things that I was really interested in, this is where my book kind of focused on, and what I was really just fascinated by is that history, because it does look at individual moments, doesn't do a very good job of understanding patterns or how different times relate to other times. Um, political science tries to do that, but like I said, they usually do it numerically and sort of devoid of personality. But one of the questions that, that just drove me crazy was um, in political science, all of, our, all of our work on nominations pretty much said, people who are front runners win. And I thought, okay, well, isn't that kind of tautological? I mean, the person in the front wins. Okay, I get that. So my question was, how do you get to be a front runner? What does that actually mean to get to the place where an entire political party asks this question of who should be our nominee? And they say, I know, it's blah, blah, whoever that person is. That was interesting to me. How did those individuals come to the fore within their own parties? It was also interesting to me that history spends an awful lot of time trying to talk about how different presidents are different from one another. But as a political scientist who looks more at like the whole system, I think to myself, well, geez, for the most part, they're all winners. So they might actually be fundamentally different than the losers. Because a lot of people run for president. Many more people lose than win. We've actually only had 43 in our history. We count Barack Obama as the 44th president because for those of you who don't know, Grover Cleveland gets counted twice because he served non-consecutive terms. Um, but in terms of people, we only have 43. So I thought to myself, well, geez, I bet they're more alike than different. The one thing that I will tell you and that our, our sort of um, literature rests upon is that we believe deeply that presidential aspirants are ambitious. I don't think there's anyone who would ever sort of deny that. In fact, I think they're inordinately ambitious. That's okay. I'm somebody who happens to believe that ambition is not a bad thing as long as it's directed toward the right goals. Um, I would also suggest that ambition doesn't seem to me to be enough because everybody who jumps in is ambitious. There's an old joke in politics that says every senator wakes up in the morning and sees a president in the mirror. Um, so I think it is true that we know that ambition is a huge part of politics. We don't, I don't really believe that you know, Henry Clay, who lost five presidential elections, was any less ambitious than Thomas Jefferson, who lost one and won two. Um, and I think it's important to kind of think about this. So as I was thinking about this, as I was reading history, as I was trying to develop a model, what really struck me was that the winners seem to have an uncanny ability to perceive opportunities in the environment and turn them to their advantage. And I thought to myself, well, the word that describes that is opportunist. They're opportunists. But there's this problem, and Woodrow Wilson wonderfully identifies this problem over a century ago. And that is that we think of opportunists in a negative fashion. He says in this quote, um, 
A politician, a man engaged in party contests, must be an opportunist. Let us give up saying that word as if it contained a slur. If you want to win in party action, I take it for granted you want to lure the majority to your side. I never heard of any man in his senses who was fishing for a minority. Now, if you want to win, you've got to fish for the majority, and the only majority you can get is the majority that is ready. You can't wait for the majority of tomorrow. If you want a majority today, you have got to take the opportunity as you find it and work on that, and that is opportunism, that is politics, and it's perfectly legitimate. I would, I would completely agree with this. In addition, I also think that the interesting part about the word opportunism is that when somebody doesn't capitalize on an opportunity that comes their way, or they miss it, we usually think that person's foolish. So we demonize individuals who grab opportunities, but we also criticize those who miss them. That's, that seemed to me a little bit perplexing. And, and speaks to, I think, the, the difficult nature of the word and the idea. I will tell you just because it's something that is fascinating to me that the word opportunity itself comes from a Greek um, sort of origin that is related to the word poros, um, which is actually where we get the word poor and port. So a port of entry, a pore in your skin. So opportunists are really what one might call, as Lewis Hyde, um, who's written about opportunists, um, he calls them poor seekers. They're always looking for holes. They're looking for holes in the fabric, ways to essentially move the structure to another um, angle. And I will tell you that as I wrote this book, what I realized is the problem with our presidents is actually not their opportunism. I measured opportunism um, as being about someone's breadth of experience in politics over their depth of experience in politics. So how many different offices had they served over how many years had they served? And I essentially came to that because I was thinking about business, and, and, interestingly enough. I was thinking about how somebody who stays in one company for 20 years has a very different perspective on a specific market than somebody who has been at four companies for five years each, all in the same kind of market, but they have different perspectives on the world. And my theory was essentially that the more different places you've served, the more likely you are to perceive opportunities early and have a sense of how to capitalize on them. That certainly explains why long-serving long senators do a really bad job um, when it comes to running for president. It's because essentially they've been institutionalized to only see one aspect of our political system. And so this, this notion to me that this breadth over depth of experience means something turned out to be that those aspirants who had right around essentially half, um, like they had a, a percentage or a ratio of 0.5, Right? So they essentially had half the number of positions as years in office, tended to be the ones who won, right around there, between essentially 0.4 and 0.6. The ones who were more than 0.6 were actually people who were then thought to be kind of opportunists, like William Jennings Bryan um, and Henry Clay, and some others who all of a sudden people look at and go, ew, they're too slick. Um, the ones under sort of the point four tended not to do a very good job of, of sort of finding the opportunities and they tended to be kind of Johnny come lately's to the party. And what I, I looked at was this was fascinating. But then I realized, okay, we still have a problem in our presidential elections and <laughs> our problem is we seem to not really like many of our recent presidents. Um, we have some really serious issues with them. And what's going on? And well, what I realized is, is that the biggest problem is that the numbers, so the numerator and the denominator that made up that percentage vastly changed over time. 
In other words, Thomas Jefferson, who was actually our most experienced president, had 17 political offices that he ran for, was appointed to, elected to, or essentially served in. So he was appointed to some things, he turned them down, but nonetheless, when you sort of include all of those opportunities that he had to serve in politics, um, it was 17. It was over a number of 32 years. Okay, so the idea that he was a citizen legislator, just get that out of your mind. Absolutely crazy. In fact, our framers, um, and really the era before essentially the second generation takes over of Andrew Jackson and Henry Clay, and um, sort of those politicians of that era, the antebellum time frame, were actually our most experienced politicians we've ever had. So when people say to you, I know, let's get someone who knows nothing about politics to run it, what I will tell you is that's a really bad idea. It's just a bad idea, and it's really the only profession where this holds any credence. I mean, do you want your heart surgeon done by, like, you know, an electrician? No. Oh, great, well, he understands electricity. Okay, no. It's a little different in the heart than in, right, your house. And this is where there is something of um, a disconnect. And one of the other things that's very true is that our modern day politicians, since we essentially um, changed our nominating system after McGovern Frazier, after um, Hubert Humphrey was nominated in 68, have all been sort of the least um, experienced that we've had. So for instance, George W. Bush had run for, been elected to, served in, or appointed to three offices. He had a total of six years of experience before he became president. Barack Obama wasn't much better. He was about, if I recall correctly, because he wasn't officially part of my study, but I calculated it later, I think he was five and uh, 12. But many of those years were as a state legislator in Illinois in the minority party. Okay, so a minority party legislator has almost zero power. So I just put that before you because I think it's important to understand this. And this is where I say, at some level, I think our country has been continually doubling down on this idea of bringing an outsider to politics since we lost trust in insiders after LBJ and Richard Nixon. Vietnam and Watergate destroyed American trust in essentially our political institutions and in our system itself and certainly, to a certain degree, in politicians. We've had brief moments of recovery, but the long story is down, down, down. And so we keep saying, I know, we'll get somebody who knows nothing about politics, we'll bring them to Washington, they'll fix it, and won't it be great? Then they get to Washington, they know nothing about politics, they fail, they make us even more upset, and then we decide we need somebody even more of an outsider. So I do sort of think we're a little bit like a drug addict that keeps um, upping the dosage because we keep trying to find the solution. Now I will also tell you that it's not unprecedented in our history. This is what we did in the Gilded Age. Um, we had other sort of things that motivated us, but we still wanted actually political reformers who were not wedded or indebted to the bosses. So we had sort of different issues, but we did the same thing, and we did the same back and forth, back and forth that we've done recently. And I will tell you, the interesting part is, I think this is just part of history. We have to work through it this way. We are, as a country and as a collective, a little bit like an individual, right? Most individuals don't change until they're forced to. So whether you think you like change or not, I think the reality is the vast majority of people like change in theory, they hate it in fact. And just ask yourself how many times you really enjoy moving, right? Oh yeah, isn't it great to move? Hmm, no. I mean, the truth is we're creatures of habit. We do like routines. We don't really like change. We like the idea of change. So there is something that usually makes us force our way through this. 
So what I want to kind of get to today, and I was to a certain, certain extent um, alluding to this in my remarks, is this as you find it issue. So if Woodrow Wilson tells us that opportunists capitalize on essentially the opportunity as you find it. One of the things that I think is very true about um, where Donald Trump came into this story is that he found the Republican Party in an oddly paradoxical place. It is actually tremendously strong right now in terms of number of elective offices. In fact, it hasn't, there haven't been this many Republicans in the US House of Representatives um, since the 20s, 1920s. Um, but at the same time, it's been unbelievably divided. It is profoundly um, sort of fractionalized and not cohesive. So for Donald Trump, that's a tremendous opportunity, really for any politician, if you knew the kind of poor through which you should move. It was a huge opportunity for him. And I just want to say that like my, what my book does is essentially talk about how these coalitional changes take place in parties. And what I argue in my book is essentially that how these changes take place are through presidential nomination fights, and the winners are the ones who massively impact their parties. And if they actually go on to win the presidency, then they impact both political parties. And that it's really, if you will, the presidents and their aspirants who are the, um, the agents of change in our, in our political system. And I spent a long time talking about why it's the presidential aspirants um, in my book, which I'm not gonna go into today. But I just wanna give you a, a sense of how strong the Republican Party was going into this election. So prior to the invisible primary really starting in 2015 and where we are today. The Republicans, as I said, have a huge majority in the House. Um, you know, 247 to 188. Um, they had 246 back at one point in Truman's administration, um, but they have not had above 246 since I think it was 1925. So it would have been the 24 election, which makes perfect sense because the Democrats got wiped out when they nominated John Davis. Um, the Senate right now has 54 Republicans. There are 44 Democrats and there are two independents who caucus with the Democrats. As you know, there's really nothing that can be done in the Senate without essentially 60 votes. Um, you have to be able to get cloture. I don't think I will tell you that after this election, either party is gonna get 60. We're not gonna end that way. It's probably gonna be you know, a little bit closer. I would argue that the Republicans may lose the majority. They may not if they're able to hold on in places like Pennsylvania and Florida. We'll see. But needless to say, I don't think the Senate is going to have major control. Republicans also have 32 of the 50 governorships. They control 30 of the 50 chambers. The number that I didn't put up here is that I think it's um, eight states where there are split control at the state legislative level. So the Democrats are in fact only controlling something like, if I remember my math correctly, 12 actual um, full state legislatures. So, and when you compare how the midterms have stacked up for the president's party, um, 2010 and 2014 were absolutely horrific for the Democratic Party. Um, I mean, you can see it hasn't been since Eisenhower that um, that many state legislative seats have been lost for the president's party. Um, it's, like I said, you wouldn't know this, I think, if you were just reading the news because everything seems to be like, well, Obama's in the White House, Democrats have an electoral lock, everything looks great. And there's a lot of truth to that because, interestingly enough, the Democrats 
do have strength in the big states. So in the big states, they actually are able to um, sort of make a difference at the national level because the population works toward them in those states. But in the smaller states, it, it you know, means that they're losing a senator because, you know, sorry, Nebraska is just not really going to be a great democratic place. So Democrats and Republicans, if you think about a topographical map, and then you think about, you know, what's the percentage of Dems and Republicans in each place, the way to think about it is Democrats have huge mountains um, in the coast and sort of in the bigger states around the big cities. But then they are essentially a valley everywhere else. And I think that then gives you a sense that, you know, I tell my friends who are deep, dyed in the wool Democrats, you know, if you really want to help the party, move to a flyover state. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the best thing that you can really do. Um, and we as a country have become hugely polarized. Now, here's the paradoxical part. And I will tell you today, I'm going to put up a lot of, of charts and graphs. Um, I'm just sort of showing them more for trends. I'm more than happy to give my PowerPoint um, to the IRP and you guys can sort of look at it and read it more closely at your leisure. But I think what I, I want you to understand is basically just sort of the headlines that come from these slides. And the headlines are, as strong as the Republicans are, they're not liked. So this is also a little interesting and bizarre. Um, you know, Barack Obama does have higher approval ratings. Um, the Democratic Party, in general, gets higher approval ratings than the Republican Party. Um, the sort of red bars in this chart on my um, right are actually um, from 2013, when we had the shutdown. And it, I will tell you, this is when the parties and everybody in government bottomed out. I mean, the shutdown was Democrats lost, Republicans lost, Obama lost, but Republicans lost the most um, because they were seen as responsible. And in the sort of chart up there that tracks over time from the 90s to 2015, you can actually see there's that really low one in 2013 that says 28. Um, that is essentially the favorability of the Republican Party during the shutdown, 28%. Now, just so you know, I often joke that whenever we do a survey, you can pretty much get about 20% of Americans to agree that the government's, you know, hiding aliens and that there are all sorts of, of crazy conspiracies that about 20% of the public will agree to at any one point in time. Now, of course, it's never the same 20%, but, but it is fascinating that approval in this is only 28%. And this is where, when I, when I read the statistics that say approval of Congress is down at 15% or 17%, I think to myself, so we're talking friends and family are the ones who are saying, ha, yeah, we like them. Everybody else doesn't. Um, now, I'm not saying that there aren't reasons for this. There are. But I think one of the things that's so interesting is how confused we are as a public. This um, second chart, so these two Gallup charts were actually um, done a little bit uh, last year, essentially before the 2016 election um, took place. But one of the things that's very interesting is, is that when you asked um, sort of Americans, um, you know, what is your overall opinion of the two parties' views on specific issues, um, Republicans, get really large ratings. So, for instance, on the question of um, which party better protects the country from international terrorism and military threats, Republicans got 52%. Democrats only got 36%. So here people like Barack Obama, but they think that the Republican Party does a better job of protecting us against terrorism. And this is where there is this place. My mom always says to me every time we talk about this, because I'm, I'm always sort of amazed by this every time I see these numbers. She always says to me, 
Laura, you just have to remember that we're not really like bipartisan, we're bipolar. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, we are. That's exactly right. Our country is um, pretty bipolar in our attitudes. So as I said, essentially what's been going on is that both parties haven't been doing all that well. Both parties in terms of their overall favorability are down below 50%. Um, the Republicans are a little bit worse and yet they're very strong across the country. In addition, one of the things that's been on the rise is the sort of desire and need for a third party. So Americans have been saying basically, I don't feel that either party is really addressing the issues that I care about. We need a third party. So that's been on the rise. There is also, um, or I should say there are also data which show that Americans um, when, and I, and I didn't include some of this, but it's fascinating, that when they are asked why they consider themselves independents if they vote sort of oftentimes one way or another. Because most independents don't behave in an independent fashion, meaning they don't, they don't switch parties every election. Most independents, when you actually ask them how do they behave, they tend to lean right or left. They tend to side with unbelievable frequency with um, either the Democrats or the Republicans. So when you ask them, well, geez, if you do this, then why don't you identify as a Republican or a Democrat? Basically, they say they're embarrassed by the two political parties. They're embarrassed to tell others that they are part of that mess. So one of the things that's happened is we do have about 43% of Americans right now who say they think of themselves as independents. Um, and these charts basically show how much people just don't believe that the parties are doing an adequate job. I mean, this chart, the, these data which were taken in 2015, um, basically asked people, you know, do you think the parties are doing an adequate job? 38% said yes. The rest of the country's like, hmm, I don't know. Um, so that is fascinating. This is the other piece, um, obviously, that I really wanted to talk about, which is how do we choose? So for those of you who don't know, I will tell you that um, presidential nominations um, have really never been worked out. Okay, our framers never addressed it. Um, this notion of who should choose the nominee just is not something that was ever really thought about. The Electoral College itself was um, an attempt to essentially create a nomination system because there was a notion that each state would sort of put forward their, fav their favorite sons and then when electoral um, ballots were counted, you would have no one getting a majority of the electoral votes. It would go to Congress, as it does, and then Congress would essentially choose between the uh, nominees from the states. That didn't happen because the parties worked very hard to game the system. They've now done that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but this issue of who should decide, who should choose the nominee, has always been contested. I mean, as I said, it sort of started with this notion that it was going to be the election itself that would do that. Then there started to be these gentlemen's agreements. So Madison and Jefferson were like, no, you go, no, you go. Oh, no, 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 it's you. And they were very interesting. If you read their letters, they actually do have this kind of an exchange where Madison is trying to convince Jefferson to run in 1796 and Jefferson's trying to convince Madison to run. Um, because, of course, back then, ambition was something you didn't want to kind of cop to. So both of these guys are in their own ambitious way trying to be deferential to each other. Um, and so it was this gentleman's agreement. And then they create this thing called the King Caucus, which was actually something of a, of a slur. Um, it was considered that because it was thought to be so awful that the people in Washington, the parties in Washington basically decided. So what would happen is all of the Republicans who were members of Congress would get together and they would essentially select for their party who would be the nominee. Um, that's actually how you get sort of um, Madison and Monroe. By 1824, this is starting to have a really big problem because people out in the states are a little bit upset. They want 
more input. They don't like the fact that Congress is, is making these decisions. Then, of course, they do the ultimate thing, which just frustrates everyone. In 1824, the King Caucus backed a candidate by the name of William Crawford for the presidency. Now, William Crawford had had a stroke, and he was pretty much completely blind and totally paralyzed. <laughs> Um, and basically, John Quincy Adams, William Crawford had been a, a very real political servant. I mean, don't get me wrong, he was Secretary of the Treasury, he had been a um, very active, you know, partisan. But one of the reasons why he was nominated by the King Caucus is because, guess what, he was a Virginian. And so, you know, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe all wanted to carry on the tradition of a Virginian. Well, John Quincy Adams, who was from Massachusetts, and Andrew Jackson, who had no relationship to any of these people in Washington, because he was just the crazy war general, um, said this was nuts. So they started to actually create, um, basically, they got their state legislatures to pass resolutions saying they should be president. This started to get sort of some state voice in this whole thing. Then what you have is you have the invention of the National Party Convention. That doesn't happen until 1832, no surprise, after Andrew Jackson wins, right? Because he doesn't want these silly partisans in Washington making these decisions. He changes the, the system so that state politicos can have more influence. But then we have essentially a whole time frame where it becomes the state party bosses, right? All of them sort of landing upon the um, presidents, like landing upon the convention, voting for who they wanted, and then it was over. Well, that frustrated, obviously, Teddy Roosevelt, who lost the nomination in 1912. That then led to essentially something that Robert La Follette was trying to do already, which was get primaries instituted. So primaries got instituted, but then, unsurprisingly, they didn't make the outcomes of the primaries binding to the delegate selection. So it wasn't until 1968 when Hubert Humphrey gets elected without having run in any primary that basically you had an uproar. Uh, Democrats at the convention who were the anti-war activists said, no more, we're done. Um, you know, there has to be some resolution. How they basically um, appeal to the delegates um, who are for McCarthy, you know, who had been for Robert Kennedy, who um, had been more engaged um, with other candidates. They essentially um, say, okay, we'll have a commission. We'll have a commission, isn't that what always, politicians always do? We'll have a commission, we'll study the problem, we'll come up with some reforms and resolution. That's what they did. 1970, the George McGovern, okay, you think this guy wanted to be president? So if he's gonna change the system as the head commissioner. Um, George McGovern and then uh, Donald Fraser, who took over when McGovern sort of announced his presidential aspirations, um, put together a series of reforms that required binding delegates in the states. Um, we now essentially exist under the bulk of those reforms at this point. And after those reforms started to be implemented in the 70s, we started to have essentially primaries and caucuses that created binding delegates to the national party conventions. The big problem with national party conventions is what I mentioned down the way, which is that essentially we have a situation where the calendar changes every single cycle, and it changes based upon when the states try to jockey for position because they all wanna be first but of course, Iowa and New Hampshire have statutorily protected themselves to be first, and they will always be first, um, unless the system changes after this election. Um, and I think what you're gonna essentially see, and what you do see, is that we now have what we call the invisible primary. And the invisible primary is the year or so between the midterm election and when the presidential nominations kick off. And it's that time when all of these people are jockeying for advantage. The interesting part about that is the people who tend to win are these, quote, front runners. How do you get to be a front runner? Well, you've got to sort of be something of a celebrity. 
or you have to create an upset or a surprise in an election. So we can think about um, Jimmy Carter as being essentially the first momentum candidate. Um, he did something that is actually really fascinating. He came in after none of the above in Iowa, but that was such a great finish for such an unknown guy that he became the nominee. Um, interestingly, in 2004, if you look at the Democratic race, we actually, I say we because I was involved in that race, but I will tell you that the Democrats had a very substantive field in 2004. Many Democrats um, sort of believed George W. Bush was on his heels with the Iraq war. There was no doubt that uh, the Democrats were gonna win. Hugely substantive field. You had everyone from Joe Lieberman to Wes Clark to Dick Gephardt, who was then the minority leader, you know, John Kerry. And guess what? For most of the year, Howard Dean was actually the front runner. Howard Dean. Because why? He was doing really well in the money. And everyone thought, that's it, that's it. John Kerry wins um, New Hampshire. He, he wins Iowa, and then he goes on to win New Hampshire. And you know what? That's it. The story is written. No one ever looked back because the momentum was so strong. And part of why the momentum was strong was because the party was so tired of being so divided all year. Some were behind Edwards, some were behind Kerry, some were behind Dean, some were waiting for Wes Clark. There was a lot of pressure and jockey. And so when all of a sudden Kerry looked like a winner, it was like, he is a winner. Let's, let's go with him. To a certain extent, that did happen to Donald Trump this year, okay? They had a very substantive field for the Republican Party. You could talk about, you know, governor, former governors, current governors, senators. It was actually their strongest field that they've really had in the modern time. And what really happened was there was so much uncertainty, I think, in the entire sort of couple years leading up to it. No one knew if it was going to be Rubio or Bush or um, one of these other kind of establishment type candidates. And, and then what you saw was that Donald Trump, even though he lost Iowa to Ted Cruz, which scared a huge portion of the party, then Trump wins in New Hampshire. And so now the, the part that is upset about Cruz is kind of happy, but the part that's upset about Trump is now worried. And they all tried in South Carolina to like put in one of the establishments. It was either gonna be Jeb or Rubio. So Rubio was, was endorsed by Haley and Tim Scott, and um, Bush was endorsed by Lindsey Graham. And guess what? Donald Trump wins. So then when Donald Trump wins South Carolina, I would argue that to a certain extent the race was over from a media momentum standpoint. Um, and it was, Cruz stayed around for a while because the rest was essentially Cruz had won Iowa. Um, and this is where I think the party got into a little bit of trouble. But this problem of, of front loading where all the states try to be first and they all tend to jam up into the beginning and the invisible primary, which is so long and drawn out and is not at all invisible, um, at least not any longer. We watch every poll, every everything in the year before. Um, also has this problem where we end up with this very decisive time frame that is a very short time frame. And usually the candidates with great name recognition end up winning because that's who everybody knows. So this is where the it sort of becomes something of a, of a vicious cycle. Um, one of the things that I just wanted you to see quickly, because I know we're running out of time, is, um, is in fact sort of where things were prior to, we, to starting kind of Iowa. These charts take you through the end of November. And essentially what you see is that, you know, Hillary among Democrats always had the Democratic Party. And I will tell you, this was true all the way through the contests. Every time you had essentially closed contests, closed primaries, meaning only partisans can really vote in them, she won. When you had open contests where independents could vote, she'd lose. Um, so one of the things that is very interesting is, in fact, 
if the Republicans had had things like superdelegates, which Democrats get really, really mad about, um, I guarantee you they wouldn't have had Trump. Um, if Republicans had had proportional representation the way Democrats do, they wouldn't have had Trump. Similarly, if Hillary had had the rules of the Republican Party, many more winner-take-all, and many more um, essentially closed contests, she would have won handily, more quickly. It probably would have been over by Super Tuesday. Um, this is a huge chart, which I'm not going to go into, but really what it says is where the different Republican candidates were in terms of their favorability um, among different demographics of those Republican and Republican-leaning individuals. And Trump was doing far better. He had much higher, essentially, favorability ratings among men in the Republican Party um, than many of his counterparts. So I think what is so interesting is, if we understand the Republican Party, first we should know that um, it does have and attract more men than women. The Democratic Party actually has more women than men in it. And so Trump, way at the outset, was basically doing well among the most important demographic, essentially white men, prior to this happening. He was doing poor in, interestingly enough, the Midwest and the West. But the Midwest and the West didn't really vote till later. Iowa was the only Midwest. So he ends up sweeping, essentially, you know, white men in the South, and then that takes him to sort of um, unprecedented victories here in, you know, New York, Connecticut, um, Massachusetts. I will tell you the most shocking number to me in Massachusetts was Trump earned 49% of the vote there. And I thought to myself, what in the world is going on? This is Massachusetts. How could Donald Trump be doing this well? But why he did so well is because Massachusetts Republicans aren't hugely religious. And so the fact that Donald Trump wasn't that religious, they actually looked at their choice between Ted Cruz and him, and they're like, oh yeah, Trump's better. Um, those in, this, in the South actually did split more Cruz and Trump because their evangelical uh, Christianity meant more to them. Um, just to say a quick word about the Electoral College, because we're like, we're really <laughs> um, spinning down on time. So the Electoral College, for those of you who don't know, the thing that I think is most important about what it does, people don't really understand its effects. The thing that it does more than anything is it forces a presidential candidate to win in a lot of places. So in other words, it's not just the idea that you've got to win a lot of votes, but you have to win a lot of votes in the right places. And what that means is it also makes sure that, for the most part, almost all of our presidents have won a majority of states in addition to winning um, the majority of people. Now, we've had, obviously, elections where the majorities flip around um, in the sense that, you know, Al Gore won more people but he didn't win the Electoral College. But those kinds of elections only really happen when we as a country are basically at 50-50. Um, the Electoral College, if anything, it tends to magnify um, the winner's vote percentage. So as I said, what's interesting to me about it is it makes sure that basically no president could get elected by just winning like five states, um, which from a population standpoint, you probably could, though we can't imagine that Florida, Texas, California, New York, and Illinois would all go together. <laughs> In the, but theoretically, numerically, if it were possible, it could happen. That said, this map basically scales each one of the states to population because what most people don't realize is that the state's electoral college vote is simply just the state's congressional delegation. So it's your senators plus your House members. Now, neither senators nor House members are um, permitted to vote. In fact, electors, according to the Constitution, must be, um, have no, has it, let's see if I can remember exactly what it says. They must hold no office of trust or profit under the United States government. So many electors are actually like 
mayors, um, state legislators, party leaders. They're people who essentially each party loves in that state. And they get to do this. And what it means is that in December, they go to their state capitol and they basically cast their ballots for the party's nominee. That's how this essentially works. Over the last 40 years, as population's been changing, because obviously your number of House members changes bases based on the census every 10 years, your number of electoral votes also changes as a state. And over the last 40 years, so four different censuses, we've essentially seen um, a huge sort of shift in, in electoral vote and congressional power from essentially the Rust Belt to the Cotton Belt. I would also argue that this is part of Donald Trump's appeal right now. If you're in the Rust Belt, um, you've lost power, period. That's hard. It's hard for anyone to lose power. Um, you know, I often say my dad graduated law school in 1968, and um, I grew up in California. He went to law school in California. He went to Hastings, which is a public um, law school as a part of the UC system. And the interesting part is I said to my dad, Dad, when you applied for your first job as an assistant district attorney in Riverside, how many people do you think were in the applicant pool who were not white men? And he said to me, huh, that's really, that's, that's kind of interesting. He said, well, he said I had, there was one woman in my law school class and there were two African American men in my law school class. And this is San Francisco, 1968, okay? Hate Ashbury, all the you know things that you remember about it. So what's important about that is I, I've said to my dad this often, Dad, what you have to realize is that, because my dad's 74 if I remember, he's either 73 or 74. Um, but he said, he said to me, you know, I, I, he said, Laura, I just don't understand what's going on. Because I always say my dad's like, your classic Hubert Humphrey Democrat. He really, he really is. And I, I've said to him, I'm, I'm like, Dad, you have to understand that the Trump voters, they see what you had essentially in 1968 and what they have today as being really problematic. So in 1968, white men who were Protestant, um, you know, because let's face it, we only elected one Catholic, that was a really big thing, um, was essentially, they had 100% of the power. So 40% of the population had 100% of the power. Now we're talking about the fact that about 40% of the population has about 60% of the power. But you know what? I mean, so even though they have a majority of the power, all they perceive is a loss of influence. A loss. So that's hard. Um, nobody likes to lose power. The important part about the Electoral College that, are, that I always try to get across to people is that the way to think about it is it's like the World Series, it's not the Super Bowl. So if you think of every state as a game, you actually have to win the majority of the 51 games, and we have 51 because the District of Columbia is included in that. And you essentially have to win the majority of those to get the electoral votes you need. Now we know no one when a World Series um, team is sort of crowned as the champion, runs around and says, yeah, but my team got more runs over the course of the series. No one says that. Why don't we say that? Well, we don't say that because we accept the rule. So why we have issues with the Electoral College is really more that we just don't accept the rule that exists. Um, and so it makes the outcome somewhat contested. But the reality is, as you can see from this example up there, you can win four games and still have fewer total runs than the other team. In fact, I was talking about this when I think, if I recall back in like 2012 maybe, St. Louis Cardinals had one game where they like hit up 12 runs or something absolutely ridiculous and then they went on to lose the series. Um, so I think it's fascinating because nobody really does say this. As I said, the parties game the system. So nowadays what happens is when you vote, you are voting for your party slate of electors. That's who you're voting for. So basically both parties put forward um, th the number of names they need in each state to be an elector prior to the election. 
The election itself decides which slate of electors gets to cast ballots. Um, just to give you a little backdrop, this is where we are, right? 2012, um, Barack Obama won a lot of electoral votes, but actually you wouldn't know that if you just looked at the fact that they were only 5 million votes apart because he actually won a much narrower popular vote victory than he did electoral college vote victory. This is one of the reasons why the electoral college from a political science standpoint is not bad. It creates institutional stability in our system. Um, but it's important to know that Barack Obama is one of the only incumbent presidents in a very, very, very long time um, to essentially get fewer votes in his reelection than he did in his first election. So, you know, 2012 turnout was down. Um, Obama and Biden earned more than 69 million votes in um, 2008. They only earned 66 million in 2012. McCain earned about 60 million um, in 2008. Romney Ryan had 61 million. So again, this speaks to the fact that during those four years of essentially leading up to 2012, the Republicans were actually in the ascendancy. They are strong. They did get a lot of state offices. They actually had more votes in um, 2012 than they did 2008. So you would definitely, I would tell you, looking at this election, suggests that the Republicans should be favored. And they should also be favored to win because of other political science factors. This is an open seat election. An open seat election uh, tends to essentially create more competition, force people to look prospectively, not retrospectively. Um, but interestingly, it's also an incumbent election. And, as, and what I mean by that is we've essentially had an incumbent party for two terms. And we, as a country, after a party has served two terms in the presidency, we tend to go, mm, done next, and we switch. So Bush Sr. was the last um, individual to have won a, a third term for his political party since um, actually before 1952. So typically it's two terms and out. Typically the, Re the Republicans should be winning. It's a time for change. But this is where the candidates matter. Um, I would say that had the Republicans chosen anybody but Donald Trump, they would probably be leading in all the polls right now. But they're not, because Donald Trump is a problem. Obviously, presidential approval, national satisfaction, whether or not people think about the economy or the foreign policy matter tremendously in terms of how they vote. Um, this just kind of goes through what I just mentioned about open seat elections. The one thing that is very true about open seat elections is that there are high levels of undecideds prior um, to election day. People don't know what they're gonna do, and they don't know what they're gonna do because what they say in their mind is, I don't know either candidate. Which one do I think would be better? But what happens in an incumbent election is you end up in a referendum. So you say to yourself, do I like the person there or not? If it's not, you vote for the other one. Um, if it's yes, you keep that one. So it's a different kind of question. It's not a question of choosing. It's actually a question of yes or no. Um, and it changes how these things look. I will tell you, 2008 was actually a typical open seat election until Lehman Brothers failed. When, when September 15th happened and Lehman Brothers failed and the bottom fell out of our economy, everyone in the country went, no more Republicans. And it was that simple. Um, and that's part of what brought Barack Obama to such a large victory. Um, it is true that our party identification is largely split. We've been split for a very long time. People don't believe this because we all live near many more partisans who are like us than not. So the problem is, is when you interact, you interact with like all your Democratic friends. You think everybody's a Democrat. You go, oh, of course. But the Republicans feel the same way. When they interact with their Republican friends, they're like, who are these Democrats? And nobody knows each other. And this is part of the problem. This is actually a map that shows the counties where it was essentially a close vote. All other counties were highly 
polarized, meaning all like really strongly Democratic or really strongly Republican. Um, and what we've essentially seen over time is that more and more Democrats are living near more and more Democrats and more and more Republicans are living near more and more Republicans. And we have fewer places in this country where we're actually um, closely divided. And this is where you end up with this um, polarization where we don't understand each other. Not only that, not only do we not understand each other, we fear and dislike each other. Um, I will tell you that Pew put out some research about a year ago that showed <laughs> that many more people who are active partisans in America are more afraid of their child bringing home and dating and marrying somebody from the other party <laughs> than they are of anything else. Anything else. Not religion, not race, not another country. I mean, the look who's coming to dinner is now... Oh, the other party. Um, this is insane. I mean, this is really insane. Um, and I'm not going to tell you that the parties aren't partially responsible for this. They are. They spend their days sending you emails telling you that everybody on the other side is evil and end times are upon us if they win. That's a problem. Because really, if you're advocating for a one-party system, you're advocating for a dictatorship. And I just want you to think about that. A healthy democracy is a two-party competitive system. And by the way, our very open-minded Democrats, like me, right? The percent of Democrats who say Republicans are more closed-minded than other Americans, 70%. So 70% of Democrats who think of themselves as open-minded assume Republicans are closed-minded. That's really open-minded, isn't it? Um, in fact, Republicans actually think a little bit more favorably about Democrats, which surprised me. They, they only about 52% of them believe that Democrats are closed-minded. And all of this shows that essentially those who are more politically engaged hold these opinions even more strongly than those who are not. So when people tell me what should I do going forward, I usually tell them stop paying attention to politics. That's a sad thing for somebody who's a political scientist who loves history to say. But what I know is that it's going to make you more distrustful. It's going to make you decide the other side is evil. And it's going to convince you that basically the world is like Chicken Little and the sky is falling. And the one thing I will tell you is our system was set up not to fail. That's the great part about the American system. We have gridlock because we don't agree. And all of those people in Washington are representing those very polarized districts, and we don't agree. So one of the, the huge things that I just think is, is so unbelievable to me is that we are at this place where we believe these things. So 62% of highly politically engaged Republicans say that the Democratic Party um, essentially being in charge makes them feel afraid. 70% of Democrats believe that about Republicans being um, in charge. Okay, this is crazy. Like I said, Madison, James Madison, Federalist 10, very thoughtful political thinker, said enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. And what you need to know is our system was precisely created to do that, to make sure that no one person could throw the whole thing. So basically, the way our framers worked it out is, we get gridlock until we get agreement. And we, we don't get agreement until everybody's kind of on the same page. Or, and this is what it means, a political party wins three elections in a row because we have staggered terms. We don't do that. And not only that, the parties lie to you. They tell you every single election, if we just win this one, we'll, we'll do everything we can. No. They can't. They have to win three in a row. No one's won three in a row since we go back to like FDR times. It just doesn't, it's just not our way. The interesting part is our ideologies don't change all that much. We're still essentially a center-right country. When you add together the moderates and the conservatives, that's what you get. That said, liberals have grown. I think part of that is because 
Uh, Democrats have done a very good job of essentially reclaiming the word liberal. It used to be completely um, problematic. So again, Obama's approval is high. Um, it's above 50%. National satisfaction is horrific. It's below 30%. Um, our trust in government leaders is at like all-time lows. In fact, um, only 42% of Americans believe that they should have trust in their political leaders. 75% of Americans a few years ago thought that our um, system was corrupt. Voter satisfaction this election is worse than we've seen in years. So one of the things that's actually really fascinating about this is if the candidates matter, you think we would have gotten some candidates we're all excited about. Nope. Um, we actually have as low a satisfaction with our presidential candidates as we had in 1992. Um, in fact, the favorability of Trump and Clinton are in the mid to low 30s. The number of voters that say Trump and Clinton are trustworthy are in the low to mid 30s. So the vast majority of Americans basically say, I dislike both candidates and I don't trust either one. That leaves us with a huge problem. How are we gonna vote? Um, this is why the third party question is going to be a really fascinating question. I don't believe the vast majority of people are actually going to make up their mind, at least those people who are not dyed in the wool partisans one way or another, until they walk into that voting booth. It's too personal, it's too problematic, it's too fraught with all sorts of conflicting problems. Um, you know, as I said, essentially, Republicans have been winning on the terrorism issue, um, but terrorism hasn't been the most important issue. The economy remains the most important issue over and over and over again. And the two parties are basically tied in believing the American people believing who can do better in the economy. So, what does all this mean? Well, the debates are almost upon us um, Monday. The thing that worries me the most is that the debates, like much of our politics, um, they don't matter to partisans, okay? Partisans, all of, our, all of our sort of research shows that partisans basically say before a debate, who's going to win, and after the debate, they say the same thing. Okay, so nobody could, like, had to do anything in a debate, and you would have had the same answer, because partisans are on a team. They want their team to win. They believe their team won later, and they'll give rationalizations later as to why that happened, but they are not reasons for their commitments. Um, but the problem is, what does matter is actually the media commentary that happens in the immediate aftermath. Where we see public opinion change on who won the debate or not is actually a few days after the debate based upon what the media said and what those partisans said who watched the debate. Because a lot of people who aren't really partisan don't really watch the debate. Now I believe we're gonna have sort of out of control um, sort of, it, you know, numbers of audience people watching this time. I think we're gonna have a lot. But the real question is how much is um, sort of just curiosity, the next reality show, the next WWF fight, versus how, many, how much of it's going to be important. What I am worried about is that Donald Trump has profoundly low debate expectations. I don't think there's anybody in the media who think he's going to do a great job. So the problem is, this is how the logic goes. If he doesn't screw up, then he's won. Um, and Hillary has really high debate expectations because she has sort of done debates. She's long been in political office. She's uh, believed to be, if nothing else, a tremendous policy wonk, which, you know, bodes well for a candidate in a debate. But what do you do? So I'm, I am a little bit worried that all of a sudden, you know, it's going to be like Donald Trump's won again. How did he win again? It's amazing how sort of low the bar has been for him to actually win. Um, obviously, our big question remains is turnout. This is going to be an unbelievably ugly election. It already has been. It will continue to be. Because when you're this disliked as a candidate and this distrusted, all you can do is say the other guy's worse. 
That's it. That's your, that's like the brilliant political strategy that exists. The other one's worse. And this is where the interesting part about third parties might come in. Um, I was having a conversation with some third party people the other day because there's a huge kind of independent movement. And, and they, we were talking about how they could essentially garner more votes. And I just told them, well, as a political scientist, what I would tell you is you should create a whole messaging campaign that says, if you're in a safe state and you want a different you know, choice, vote third party. Because if you're in a safe state, if you're not in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Florida, if you're in New York, the truth of the matter is, sure, you can vote for your party. You can also vote your actual preference. Because I guarantee you Hillary's going to win the state. That's not a problem. So the interesting part is, at the end of the day, what the eventual percentages are of the candidates is going to actually matter. So I, I could envision a scenario where Hillary Clinton um, you know, wins 43% of the vote, like Bill Clinton did in 1992. And essentially, all of the independent candidates garner about what Ross Perot did, around 19%. And Donald Trump gets around what George Bush Sr. got at 38%. Now, that set up an electoral college landslide for Clinton. Um, but both political parties in the wake of 1992 changed. What did they do? They focused on Ross Perot's biggest issue, getting rid of the deficit in the immediate aftermath. Why? Because they were terrified. Terrified. So that's really where we are. As I sort of alluded to earlier, and I'm going to end here, is that the one big thing that I'm almost certain will happen is that we will see significant party nomination reforms after this cycle. Because whoever wins, right, Hillary, who wish the system was a little bit more like the Republicans because she would have had an easier election, or Trump, who really would have loved it if it was a national primary because he had the best name recognition, then he wouldn't have had to run anywhere except one day, um, you know, will likely motivate the Republicans to change. So I would not be surprised if given the high level of dissatisfaction with the nominees, both political parties decide 2020, the who chooses is going to be very different. So stay tuned. Um, I don't want to spend you know, too much more time like up here, but I'm happy to stick around until um, like three o'clock because I know you guys are probably anxious to get out, but I know we'll take a few questions, right? Hi. You alluded to the growing length of the campaign. Now, in reality, we have gone in 20 years from what was already a rather long American campaign tradition, much longer than the European parliamentary democracies, to an absurdly, comically long thing in reality going on more than two years. Is this part of the problem, or is this a symptom of the problem? Are we in inverting cause and effect when we look at this phenomenon? Well, so let me just say that in parliamentary systems, voters don't get to choose their nominees, which I think is very interesting, right? Um, we don't often look at sort of a European democracy and say, oh, it's undemocratic. You know, we, the voters didn't choose Cameron. They didn't choose May, right? Those people were chosen by their party. In fact, I will tell you, it's also the reason why more women have been leaders in parliaments than in presidential systems where nominations do have to go through this system because it's a lot easier to convince a few of your party colleagues in parliament that you're really a leader than an entire population um, as a woman. And that's, and that's part of what we've seen. So, I, I mean, the one thing I would say is that our system has always been this long. It just wasn't as visible. In fact, the one argument that I make in my book is that the invisible primary is really typically um, six years in length. 
Um, because usually what happens is the person who got the nomination, how they got to be front runner is that they were essentially in the party national conversation prior in the, in the prior election. Um, so if you will, Barack Obama didn't win the nomination spontaneously in 2008. He essentially won all of the non-Hillary voters at the Democratic convention in 2004. And for four years, essentially, all of those people who were behind Barack Obama said, we gotta make this happen. He's the one, not Hillary. So this is where the internal jockeying in the party is very, very long. And, and as I said, I think the only reason why Trump was able to sort of do a hostile takeover is because there was so much division in the Republicans. Anything else? Uh, as between the two parties, isn't the Republican Party more essentially fragmented? Looking ahead, past whatever happens in 2016, the party is about three different parties. Mm -hmm. Is it pro-tariffs, um, anti-tariffs? Is it pro-immigrant? Is it anti-immigrant? Is it um, uh, Wall Street or Main Street? It seems to me that the, the Republican Party is more fragmented. So what's your opinion? They are, but they're partly more fragmented because they've been out of office. So this is one of the interesting dynamics of how the parties work, is usually while they're out of office, they go through essentially a restructuring, all the coalitions fight with each other, and then essentially when they win the presidency, that coalition becomes dominant for a time. So this is where I would say what you should expect is should Hillary lose, which, I mean, I just think you have to put it up there because our elections are very competitive, um, then I would argue the Democrats would absolutely um, go into a huge moment of division, fragmentation. The, the question would be, should we move more toward the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren wing, or should we move more toward essentially the Tim Kaine, moderate Democrat uh, wing of the party? You, will, you would replay a lot of the divisions that happened in the 70s and uh, to a certain extent the 80s, which then got quieted by the new Democrats in the 90s. Yeah. You were talking earlier about front runners. Uh, I'm remembering a, an observation that John Stewart made in 2008 after some results started to be clear from primaries. He mentioned that through almost all of 2007, part of the invisible primary and early 2008, most people expected Hillary to get the Democratic nomination and Giuliani to get the Republican nomination. And then, as Stewart pointed out, then people started voting. Right. <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. And this is where what's so interesting is that those early wins mean everything, right? If Barack Obama had lost Iowa, Hillary absolutely would have won. I mean, it, it would have been over. Now, part of the problem for Hillary was actually John Edwards. If you look at the vote in Iowa, basically all of Barack Obama's coalition stayed together, um, and John Edwards basically picked up traditional Democratic men, and Hillary Clinton picked up traditional Democratic women. Um, so the sort of traditional caucus-going Democrat split between two candidates, the um, new voter and independent leaning jumped into the Democratic caucus and voted for Barack Obama and was a strong coalition, um, which then catapulted him. So at that point, you know, it was just this like, whoa, right? He's somebody. So he did what Carter did in Iowa. Hi. Uh, you said before that the, fis the system is designed not to fail. So what's the difference? Who comes into office? Uh, professional, <laughs> not professional? What do we have to lose, as someone once said? Sure. Um, what I would tell you is, is that it, it is the case that those who have experience do a better job of essentially moving the system to essentially that party's aims. So if you are somebody who is, who is deeply partisan, 
then actually you do have something to lose. Um, because if you are voting for somebody who has a lot of experience and you put them there, they will likely do a better job of getting your preferred policies through this very complicated system than not. Um, that said, I will also say that the interesting part about gridlock and the powerful part about our system is that as Washington is gridlocked, our states are growing more powerful. So one of the other things that's very interesting is for 100 years, the states basically lost power to Washington. And now, because Washington cannot act, it is so divided, and yet you see the states are, are becoming more and more polarized, more red, more blue, um, the states are able to act, and our Constitution allows them to do that. So probably in another 100 years, we might have another civil war, because our states will be so far apart in terms of their ideologies. But the interesting part about that is it also means we never have a revolution. We don't change systems. So France has changed regimes um, about five or seven times um, in terms of how, like its entire regime in the time we've had one regime. So, you know, there's, it's basically the way it works is that our, our system, politics doesn't like a vacuum. Um, and what I mean by that is the power sort of moves to those who have little power in these kinds of moments of gridlock. Um, so I may have said that wrong, but it's been a long day. <laughs> have you done any uh, study of the effect of demographic change and by that, I'm not just referring to the increased uh, Hispanic population, but also people moving around. People, the one phase of people moving to the Sun Belt, for mm -hmm. example, and now there's some other moves going on. Absolutely, and I mean, I can tell you there's a book by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort, which is really worth reading if you haven't picked it up. I haven't personally looked at those demographic changes, but I've read about a lot of them. And it is true that, for instance, a lot of the people who moved out of the Rust Belt were actually the more affluent, um, Republican-leaning voters, right? And they moved to the South, right? To go, they moved to Florida to go have nice weather in, this, in the winter. Um, and many of the people who were essentially left behind in the Rust Belt tended to be Democratic and a little bit more disenfranchised or less affluent. Um, and so one of, the, one of the realities of that movement is you essentially saw the, the South become more Republican, the North become more Democratic. Traditionally, that was not the case, right? When we go back to um, the 1960s, it was novel for Richard Nixon to create a Southern strategy. The Rockefeller Republicans had essentially run the North and even before that, progressivism as an idea was really based in the North. Um, it you know, traces back to essentially the temperance movement, to abolition, to um, women's suffrage. So progressivism as a series of ideas um, and as an ideology was really Northern based. No surprise that now, because our ideologies and our parties have become more in line, um, the North is generally democratic. The South was always conservative, intended to be more populist, right? You can think of whether you're talking about Huey Long or George Wallace, um, or even William Jennings Bryan, right? So populist ideas and ideologies were Southern. That was the original Democratic Party. Um, the parties have, as they've essentially um, sort of swapped their ideologies, they've swapped regions. Um, and some of that has been about internal movements, and some of it has just been about the party fight. Yeah. How important Wait, I think we need a microphone. Okay, because I have a loud voice. Um, <laughs> Me too, I like that. <laughs> um, how important do you think um, something called the women's vote might be? And I'm asking two questions, because how important do you think 
minorities, and I'm including, mm -hmm. I'm not just saying African American vote will be. At one time it was thought that when women got the vote, that would be a, you know, a big deal, but then it was seen that women voted the same way their husbands did. Yes, they did. Now, so, but again, that's, yeah. okay. So the interesting part about that is that um, women didn't start voting more Democratic. What actually happened, how we get the gender gap, is that men started voting more Republican. So men are the ones who left the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Johnson and essentially started moving to the party of Goldwater and Reagan. Um, and that's actually how we end up with the situation where there are basically more men in the Republican Party and more women in the Democratic Party. Um, I just wanted to go back to the map for a minute because there are some things that are really important to understand. Number one, um, women make up more than 50% of the vote, so they're actually not a consistent voting block. Um, it's, I mean, if you think about how crazy it is, nobody ever thinks Keith Olbermann and Rush Limbaugh are going to agree just because they're both white men. Like, and they don't. I mean, these people are like as far opposed as you can imagine. And the truth is that happens within uh, sort of women. So women also tend to vote their party before their gender. So that's the other piece. Um, their party matters much more. And traditionally speaking, white married women vote largely Republican. They've done that for years. Um, single women and minority women vote heavily Democratic. Um, and one of the things that's going on in this election is that some of the, the biggest um, kind of constituencies or demographics that are really uncertain is actually college-educated whites, and particularly college-educated white men. So college-educated white women right now are leaning toward Hillary, um, which is a big deal because a lot of them, if they were married, voted Republican. Um, but in this election, a lot of even married white Republican women are actually thinking about, if you will, I wouldn't say voting for Hillary, they're voting for not Trump. Um, but white college educated men, especially in the suburbs, those who are affluent, um, are a little bit torn. They want a Republican, they really want a Republican. You know, they voted for Mitt Romney, no problem. They felt like he was perfectly fine. I don't know that they would have voted for Mike Huckabee or uh, Newt Gingrich in earlier elections, but they certainly would have been, they were fine with John McCain and fine with Jeb Bush and fine with Mitt Romney. They're a little torn in this election and they don't really know where they're gonna be. And this is where minorities, in fact, in this election, I would argue, are to a certain extent not gonna be, and I don't wanna say as important, but the reality is they have huge um, sort of vote percentages in favor of Hillary Clinton right now. But the problem is, is where minorities live. So like I would argue that, you know, Nevada is I think going to stay blue. Colorado is gonna stay blue. New Mexico is gonna stay blue. I would argue that Florida is gonna stay blue. And that's largely because of the Hispanic vote, but also um, African Americans in Florida. Um, I don't know where Virginia is gonna go. It is right now staying blue, but I think it's difficult. Um, there are a lot of African Americans there. And there are a lot of Northern Virginia technology workers who are very democratic, um, but in the southern parts of the state, it's still very white, traditional, uh, evangelical, conservative, and, um, and even with a lot of college-educated men, right? So Virginia is still in that toss-up world. Iowa is like 99% white. So minorities aren't gonna make a difference there. Neither um, will minorities make that much of a difference in New Hampshire. New Hampshire has its own kind of independent streak. It, it does interesting things, right? It went for Bush in 2000, but, but Kerry in 2004, which was opposite the way, right, the election ended up turning out. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things um, 
that is, is sort of fascinating is when you look at Ohio, you look at Pennsylvania, you look at Virginia, you look at Iowa, you look at Wisconsin, you look at New Hampshire, these are largely very white states and if there's a minority that is a substantial portion of the population, it is African Americans. So then it's gonna probably come down to turnout. Um, you know, how many of those white college educated men say, you know, I'm not okay with Trump, but I'm okay with the Republican Party and I'll do a better, I'll have more of the policies I like if I just get the Republicans in. One of my dearest political scientist friends, um, Jim Campbell, who is a Republican, who's up at SUNY Buffalo, um, wrote an entire op-ed not long ago talking about like a plea to Republicans to please vote Republican because it's not about Trump, it's about the party and the policies. I don't know that, I, I would argue differently with him, but this is where the question of minorities I, I think the, the states where you have large percentages of minorities are gonna go for Hillary, period. I tend to think that's where we're gonna be. So I think, did we wanna take one more? You wanna wrap up? Okay. Thank you everybody. Refreshments, um, meet the new members and we'll reconvene October 21st. <laughs>